This is August the 25th, 2019. This is lesson 13 out of our unit number three, titled Covenant, A Personal Perspective. And our lesson number 13 for this Sunday is titled Family Commitment which is uh, quite fitting uh, for the scriptures that we will be entertaining from our lesson, family commitment. There's a certain irony to that title out of our uh, Faith Pathway study manual. Our devotional reading is from the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 7 through 13, and then our background scripture is Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the 21st verse, and also the sixth chapter, verse 4. And our printed passage is Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 33. And our key verse is Ephesians 21, and it reads, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Our lesson's aims are, summarize the relationship Paul describes as proper between a husband and a wife. Appreciate the holy relationship that exists between a husband and wife, which transcends the physical, emotional, and psychological dimensions and touches the spiritual. Cultivate a climate within the church where marriages can flourish and display the holiness described in the text. Now, our lesson is divided into three sections, and the first one is submission equals reverence for Christ. The second one is Christ loved the church, and that would be Ephesians 5, 25 through 28. The first section is Ephesians 5, 21 through 24. And then our last section is Ephesians 5, 29 through 33, and it is entitled, The Two Become One. Now, I thought that the intro into our uh, lesson uh, was quite uh, humorous, uh, and yet it's quite fitting. And the writer uh, shared it with us uh, and then cited that <clears throat> the writer had been involved in premarital counseling for engaged women and men for more than 20 years and uh, wanted to share uh, one of uh, his reflections about marriage, which I found uh, to be quite fitting and humorous at the same time. Uh, but he mentioned about a young man coming into a uh, library, and he asked for the location of a particular book. And uh, the book was entitled Man, the Master of Women. So the librarian looked over the top of his glasses and said, Try looking under fiction. And I thought that was quite humorous and quite fitting. <laughs> so uh, one other thing he cited, and we would go ahead and indulge into our lesson, and he says, success in marriage requires more than finding the right mate. It involves being the right mate. It is not marriage that fails. It is the people that fail. So 
<clears throat> I'm going to go uh, right into the lesson because this is a topic that has been um, uh, read, it's been preached about, there have been seminars and conferences and you name it uh, based on this text. Sometimes it's been misconstrued. Uh, and a lot of times it's been biased and it's been swayed to one side or the other, uh, giving preference to one side or the other. And so uh, before we in, uh, indulge ourselves, I would first like to um, say in your spare time that to get the full insight into the lesson and uh, understand um, how we are to uh, look at uh, the scriptures that have been cited for us to reference here. Uh, first, uh, our background scripture in uh, if, um, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 7 through 13. This is the uh, chastening uh, aspect uh, lifted in the book of Hebrews, and the the focus here is is that when we read the background scripture, and then again in your spare time, read the beginning chapter of Ephesians five, and read down to the scriptures that have been listed in our lesson, and it gives us more of an overall undertaking of what the lesson is saying to us. So uh, Hebrews 12, verses 7 through 13, talks about the chastening of a father over a child. That because the father is reprimanding the child, before, because God is chastening his children and is showing that God cares that there is a relationship here, that the care that God has for his children will not allow God not to correct them, not to advise them, not to try and develop them. But if God was to leave us without reproach, if God was not to intervene on our behalf, then it would be to say that the father doesn't care for the child, that the child is being treated as though the child is illegitimate, as though the child has been abandoned. But because God does care for us, then God visits us and then God reproaches us and God tries to correct us. Uh, tries to remove the things that are impeding, impeding us from enjoying the fullness and the richness of life that God has provided for us. So if we read the uh, beginning of the fifth chapter of Ephesians, we see that Paul, when he is speaking to the Ephesians, that he is telling them certain things which develops them as individuals. So before he begins to identify the uh, two members of the institution of a family, so when we look at uh, the title of our lesson, and it says family commitment, but the lesson is focusing on, on two characters. So there aren't... Uh, other family members identified in the lesson is just the wife and the husband. So when we look at the backdrop of our lesson, we recognize here that there is verbiage, there are scriptures, there is teaching here that is directed towards developing us as individuals. It's telling us things that should not be a part of our diet, if you will. They should not be a part of our makeup. They shouldn't be a part of our behavior. And then it informs us that we're not in darkness. 
We've been brought out of the darkness into the light, into understanding, into correction, into more, uh, into a better walk in life. And it tells us about how we should engage and how we should be interacting one with another, that our actions should be fruitful, productive, and constructive. And so when we look at the lesson and draw all of our attention in on the two people identified, the husband and the wife, it first identifies us as individuals. And that is why the lesson starts off by saying, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God or in the reverence of God. And so uh, we, it would do us well to look at the full context of our lesson, which goes right back to the commentary that uh, the writer proposed at the beginning of our lesson saying success in marriage requires more than finding the right mate. It involves being the right mate. And so as we look at the scriptures preceding verse 21, we recognize how this has to do with the development of the individual. This is not just speaking uh, to us in pairs as man and woman. It's not speaking to us just in uh, a group setting as in a family or as in a group of people, but it's speaking to us as individuals and how we should engage one with another. So now let's go right into the lesson. Uh, and since we've entertained verse 21, let's go to verse 22. Um, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, because Christ is the head of the church, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Uh, and everything that we do in the church is to be acceptable unto God. And in the like manner, as though we are doing it in reverence to Christ, the head of the church. So um, now, sometimes wording automatically has a rejection and a retaliation to it. And we have to also consider that in our lesson, Paul mentions about the timing, uh, or the writer, should I say, mentions about how the structure of the household has changed uh, from the time of Paul's writings. And so uh, even today, you know, we used to say uh, the man brings home the bacon. Well, uh, today, uh, a lot of men aren't bringing home the bacon. They're still men, but they're not bringing home the bacon. And so they're not the primary breadwinner in the home. And so that can no longer be used as a uh, declaration of who runs the house. And even the thought of who runs the house is out of place. There are responsibilities in the household, and it requires the participation of all of the inhabitants of the household. So who runs the house? All of us participate in the running of the house. But somebody has to be charged with the responsibility of the upkeep of the house. And God, Scripture, Bible says that God first charges the man and says unto him, if there is failure in 
this structure, this institution, that I chose to put you as being responsible for the maintenance and the upkeep of it, I will first see after you for its failure or for its problems or for its default or for its dysfunction. I will see you first. So um, the wife uh, being in submission, I want to get back to the point of the verbiage, words that automatically receive rejection and retaliation and unacceptance. Uh, when we look at the society of today, much different from the society during the time of Paul's writings. So, uh, but we must say some of the same characteristics are still present because suppression and force against uh, the will of others has existed uh, for many eons, shall we say. So we can't just say that suppression and oppression uh, and things of this sort just came up in, in, in our present day. But when those things exist, when there are certain things that are suppressed and certain uh, realities of uh, people, uh, certain functions that are oppressed, when words like submit are used, it's almost as though you're saying, I need to still be submissive to this suppression and oppression. And so sometimes the wording that is used automatically receives a rejection because I'm not going to submit myself to anybody who is suppressing me or oppressing me. Uh, I, I was not created to be subdued or subjected to any kind of second class, third class status or to any level that is the will of man and not the will of God. So when we think about uh, the wording in the submission here, um, we look at it in another light. And that is, is that God did not make a mistake when God created man and woman, female and male. In fact, God's creation of females and male is the expression of the entity and the qualities and the attributes of the spirit of God embodied in physical form through the identity of male and female. And this is why it said the two shall no more be twain but one, because when we recognize the God that is in both of us, we realize that when we come together as one, we are actually typifying the spirit of God manifesting itself in two different elements, but con combined together, we have typified the presence of the spirit of God through feminine and masculine expressions. So when we speak of in submission, it is into being uh, in, in the mode of I am complementing, I am enhancing, I am recognizing the other side of myself. And when a husband 
is truly a husband, when we look later in the lesson and recognize that Paul is telling the man, it starts off as though it is being a directive and it goes straight to the woman. Uh, do what the man says. The man is the head. Uh, you do whatever the man tells. The man runs the house. You follow uh, his lead. But then it goes on and it begins to tell the husband and you get your act together and you love your wife as though you are loving yourself as Christ loved the church. And what is lifted here is, is that Christ loved the church so much that Christ sacrificed. Many times we don't want to sacrifice. Christ sacrificed his life that we might have life eternal. So the combination of the lesson of the union between us as men and women and in the role of the man is, is that if we sacrifice, if we do what we want women to do, if we would see ourselves, in fact, the lesson even speaks of us about that the husband ought to love their wives as their own bodies. So what you expect, the expectations, the sacrificing, the compromising, the agreeing, the going out of the way to do for ourselves, to, and I'm speaking from the man's perspective, uh, I want a mate who will go the extra mile for me. I want her to consider me. I want her to, you know, make sacrifices or this, that, and the other. I'm not speaking of myself. <laughs> I threw that in for humor. Uh, but I'm saying in general. Then if these are the expectations as men that we seek our women to have, then first, we have to be the model of that. We have to demonstrate sacrifice. We have to demonstrate going the extra mile. We have to demonstrate uh, that we will uh, do things uh, out of the ordinary to please her, to reward her, to let show her appreciation. And so when these things are done, we don't have to ask for gestures or for certain acts of kindness and love uh, in return. They will automatically come. God made it that way. It is in the makeup of us as males and females that God made us to complement each other, not to complicate each other. God made us to enhance each other, not to erase each other. And so when we look at this, the other thing I wanted to mention about the husband is the head of the wife. i never forget this. But a minister came and preached at our church some years ago. And uh, he said, honey, he was uh, <laughs> uh, citing uh, a uh, wise uh, insight that he received. And he, he was saying, honey, I am the head. I run, I'm the head of the household. And he said, his wife said, yes, honey. You are. You are the head. But I am the neck. Now try moving your head without the neck. Now some of us have had this experience. You woke up and you had a crook in your neck. And you were trying to move against the crook. But the crook would not allow you to turn your head all the way to one direction because there was a cramp in your neck. And so 
Sometimes, as the head of the household, <laughs> you can uh, cause a cramp in your neck in the relationship. And you want to go in one direction, but you can't because the neck won't turn. The neck won't respond. And so I never forgot that. And I've always referred to that in my head that I may be the head, but my wife is the neck. And so I look at it along those lines. All right, now let us uh, go back to our lesson. Um, so we're speaking of as Christ uh, loved the church. We're into the second section now. Um, and uh, when we think of this here, as uh, this comes after the uh, note, uh, notes that were listed about uh, different roles in terms of the things that uh, used to be used as establishing who runs the house. So who makes the most money? Uh, who has the most degrees? Uh, uh, who... Um, uh, is the breadwinner of the home. Uh, all of these uh, different uh, citations and things we lift uh, to try and establish that, no, this is why I run it. But in our second segments here, looking into our lesson, and now... Paul is saying, husbands, you ought to love your wives even as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for it. He sacrificed for that. Uh, uh, the other thing that is listed here is, is that, that he might sanctify and cleanse it uh, with the washing of water. By what? By the word. The word cleanses. And then it was used so that it would present the church without a spot or a wrinkle or any blemishes or things of that sort. Marriage is a cleansing. True marriage, it, it helps us to maintain this, this marvelous body that God created and, and gave unto us. It, it keeps us from being tainted from the things in the world. So the marriage actually, it, it, it keeps your mind sound. When, when we really engage as partners, when we really engage as we are in a relationship, it, it, it means uh, we have certain tangible and untangible spiritual and natural things that when they connect, they actually formulate and generate a certain aura about us that encapsulates us. It, it surrounds us. It's a covering for us. And it matures us. And it presents us unto God in the union in which God created us to be. And so uh, marriage is a blessing. Um, and at the same time, when we speak about marriage, we recognize the person who's writing this, Paul, was not married. Yet he was still blessed with words that are uh, uh, a encouragement and a building and a uh, and, and a. Well, we'll stick with that encouragement and building for the relationship between man and woman, even though Paul was single. So when we speak of marriage, we don't just speak of it as though 
Uh, it is for everybody. The union between male and female does not have to be sanctioned by a marriage license. And I'm not talking about the people that are just um, engaging, well, back in the day, we used to call it shacking up. I'm not talking about people who are practicing the uh, benefits of marriage without marriage. Uh, I'm not speaking along those lines. I'm speaking along the lines that the union between males and females as brothers and sisters, as cousins, relatives, as friends, associates, as co-workers. I'm saying that the union between a male and a female has other expressions that don't always have to end in marriage. In fact, when our lesson said started off with family commitment, but it only identified two people, the husband and the wife, that union that is between male and female, it is a broader context because from that union, we develop other members of the family. And so therefore, we have to learn how to interact. The first example that is portrayed before a child as to how a man and a woman engage one with the other is through the parents of that child. And if that is demonstrated properly, then that child, when they go to school, when they're in the neighborhood, when they see others, they know how they are supposed to engage with members that are like themselves. So they know how to engage with other males. They also know how to engage with females because they see the example from mom and dad. And so from this union, when we uh, started and it said family commitment, but I only talked about two members of the family, those two members are responsible for displaying how these two entities and expressions of God, how they interact one with the other because they represent the principles of feminine and masculine qualities and expressions and characteristics from one spirit, one God, but being expressed in two different entities. So um, when we uh, think about the responsibility of how a man uh, should engage with his mate, with his wife, and his wife with her mate, with her husband. Uh, Paul then tells us in the last section of our lesson, the two become one. Those two principles, feminine and masculine, male and female, the two different elements contained in one, but express the spirit of God. So then when we look at this, when they join together, they become the one that produced them from one source. So that oneness is to be expressed through two different entities, but expressing it that we are joined together. What are we missing in society today? We are all separate parts. Our separateness is killing us. But we came from oneness. The two are no longer twain, but they became one. And when 
our oneness is expressed in our household, then it's carried to the next household. And we are neighborhoods. We are communities. We are a society. We are a nation. We are a world of oneness because we all came from the one source. In the book of Acts, God says, and from one blood, God made all people. We are one. The divisiveness is what's killing us. So the end of our text uh, says um, that no man ever hated his own flesh but he nourishes it, he cherishes it. Men, we think about what we do for ourselves. If we love ourselves, we try and take care of ourselves. We try to nourish ourselves, develop ourselves, improve ourselves. How can we do that if we belittle and degrade and denigrate our mate? How can I be one if I make my mate two? Why does my mate have to be subjugated to a position lower than myself just so they can be my mate? What is so superficial about me that the only way I can be me is if my mate is less than me? These are hardcore facts that we have to look at in our society today throughout the world. The scripture says, male and female created he them. It didn't say that one was less. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word, when God saw that man, it was not good for man to be alone, and he created for man a help mate, a help meet. The word is Ezer Kenedo. It means his opposite. I've shared this before, but I'm going to say it again. It didn't say his, uh, his uh, second half. It didn't say his other half. It didn't say his better half or his lesser half. It is the other, the opposite expression of himself it it is his equal not his lesser but his equal when you look at your wife you are looking at the other part of yourself in physical domain and she likewise when she looks at you, she's seeing the other side of herself in physical domain. And so we close our lesson by saying, why would you harm yourself? When we abuse women, when we belittle women, we are harming, belittling, and abusing ourselves. We come from the woman. Our start is from within her. So why would we degrade ourselves? That's what Paul is saying to us through verse 29 and 33. So it ends by another word that normally is... Uh, right away resisted and rejected. And it says, however, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. 
and the wife must see that she reverences her husband. Now we know that in the Bible, reverence, when the only time it is lifted is when it is lifted in recognition and reverence to God. The scripture, I believe it's in Psalms, and it says, and reverence belongs unto God. So we are not uh, definitely not saying that man is to be placed on the level of God. But we are saying that reverence also, it says, reverential trust. So it's saying that the wife ought to be able to trust her husband, to honor her husband. But it's not based upon the place or the position. It's not catered or it's not granted or warranted because of the title, not just because he is the husband and not just because the place, but because of the qualities. It is because of the attributes that were placed in him by God. That is what the wife respects. That's what she honors. That's what she submits to. The qualities of God emanating through her mate. We certainly hope that something was said uh, that would try and restore what God intended to have never been distorted. And as always, our prayer is, is that the blessings of God would be upon you now and always. God bless you.